Hi, this is Steve, V6WZ. I've received a number of emails asking exactly how do I bypass that CMC, the common mode choke, uh, on my Yaggies uh, when I shunt feed the tower. In my shunt feed video, uh, I did explain how those CMCs can uh, overheat, but I didn't explain exactly uh, how I did it. You know, it is possible that those chokes can heat up and cause SWR instability issues and even damage the chokes. But first of all, let's talk about why and how this can happen. When we shunt feed our tower, often, not always, there are uh, Yagis on top that act as top loading. And I mean, this is important because this is what contributes to making the uh, structure electrically long enough to load on, well, 160 meters or even 80 meters. However, this is assuming uh, that all of the Yagi elements are electrically bonded to the boom. Sometimes Yagis will use a gamma match to match the coax to the driven element. Uh, this diagram is showing the driven element, uh, that is to say the driver, as this horizontal line. The gamma match is, well, kind of exactly like our gamma matched tower. Uh, the center conductor of the coax is coupled through the uh, gamma capacitor to the gamma wire or the shunt wire in the case of our tower terminology and it's got a set spacing from the driven element and a specific tap point which will match the 50 ohm impedance of the coax. The important thing about this is notice that the driven element the driver is electrically bonded uh, to the boom. However, it's very common for Yagis to be designed using a split feed insulated driver. This is a balanced feed system. The uh, driven element is uh, split in the middle, uh, usually with a fiberglass or other insulating insert between the two dipole halves. Uh, and the boom, uh, rather the element, is insulated from the boom with either plastic or polymer lined uh, clamps. And in fact, this is a photo to the right of my 80 meter driver. You can see these uh, insulated uh, clamps which hold the uh, driver to the boom and keep it insulated from the boom. And in fact, this is the OptiBeam feed point, seeing the plastic uh, insulators uh, holding the element together. You can't see the element split. It's kind of behind these aluminum tubes, but it's uh, split with a, a fiberglass insert. Sometimes a Yagi can be designed to match uh, 50 ohm coax uh, directly. Uh, but more often than not, the impedance is uh, below 50 ohms. So we'll use something called uh, perhaps a hairpin match or uh, a coil up the hairpin. It's really the same thing. We call it a helical hairpin uh, to transform that uh, lower impedance to uh, match the 50 ohms. The issue with a split element feed is that common mode current on the outside of the coax can upset the Yagi pattern and induce noise back to the radio. You know, that common mode signal can migrate, find its way onto the Yagi and ultimately back to the radio. The remedy for this is we install a CMC, a common mode choke at the feed line. You know, we simply make the coax into an inductor to create impedance to that uh, RF that's on the outside of the, co uh, the coax. We just make a coil out of the coax. And in fact, uh, I don't know if you remember, you know, in the old days, we'd just use an air core uh, coil. In this case, you can see the real old photo of my 80 meter Yag. You know, you just made a choke, a coil out of the coax on a, on a form. Uh, maybe in the old days, you remember those Yagi instruction manuals would say, you know, bundle up your coax into a, into a coil. Well, that's, that's all we're trying to accomplish here. Of course, uh, you know, it makes a whole lot more sense to, uh, you know, wind that coax through a toroid to really, you know, increase that choking impedance. In fact, there's a photo to the right of a, a stack of cores with a Teflon coax uh, wound around uh, the cores, to, you, know, you, know, you know, providing a very high impedance. And in fact, this is a photo of my 80 meter uh, matchbox. And you can see at the bottom of the photo, that's the uh, common mode choke shown there. So what's the problem? Well, remember, the driven elements uh, is not electrically bonded to the boom. 
So if that driven element is big enough, okay, compared to the other uh, top loading elements, then when we transmit into this tower, you know, uh, there's going to be a fair bit of that transmit current wanting to flow into that element, and it is going to flow through uh, that common mode choke via the coax shield. So that choking impedance can cause that core to get hot. And that is, in fact, uh, what's happened here. In this case, this was a, the Ballon 2 my 2 element. Uh, actually, it was the Cushcraft XM240 Yagi. It was the only Yagi I had on the tower. It was the only top loading. So it felt a great deal of the uh, current wanting to flow through that choke. It heated it up and actually melted the plastic case. So what's the remedy for this? Well, it's easy. We leave the feed point coax connection as is. Okay, follow this along. We don't change anything to the feed point to our, our uh, Yaggies. Uh, we simply add a double pole, double throw relay uh, that is always grounding the driver, except when the Yaggy is in use. Okay, if you look at the schematic here to the left, you'll see the double pole, double throw relay is always the normally closed contacts are always grounding the element, which is bypassing the common mode choke. So whenever we're transmitting on uh, our shunt feed frequency, uh, this element is grounded uh, and will remain grounded. The uh, relay will then open up whenever activated, and the relay is only going to be activated when we're using the Yagi on that band. At my station, I've got a coax switch at the top of the tower. Uh, to select the various feed lines to the different Yagis. And that 12 volt control line, say for example when it selects the 80 meter Yagi, will activate this relay on the 80 meter Yagi and open it up. So whenever the 80 meter Yagi is live, uh, we have ungrounded the driven element. The same with the OptiBeam and the same with my 40 meter Yagi. Uh, you know, what about the types of relays to use really non RF rated relays will work just fine. Uh, look at uh, the, the relay here is carrying none of the transmit current going to the Yagi, right? I mean, this relay has nothing to do with uh, the transmit RF uh, that, you know, that drives the Yagi. Um, it's only grounding the element when not in use. Uh, when it's not grounded, you know, the Yagi feed point is a low voltage, high current point. So there's really the, uh, you know, limited risk of arcing because it's a very low voltage point. Uh, here's a photo of the types of relays I have used. I've used both these little Omeron relays or an open frame type can work too. Uh, you know, at the left is an Omeron G2RL-2, a little 12 volt relay. And I don't know, the, the open frame relay, I've dug it out of my junk box. In fact, here's a photo of the uh, a bypass relay that's built right into the common mode choke box for my OptiBeam. It's an open frame relay. In fact, here is a photo on the right of it mounted uh, you know, at the uh, OptiBeam feed point. And uh, this is a photo inside of the 40 meter uh, feed box to, uh, to my 40 meter beam. You can see the little Omeron relay here. This is actually the feed point right here, the little white lines I'm pointing to. It just goes to the relay and is always grounded except when the, it's activated when that Yagi is active. And in fact, it's the same thing in my 80 meter Yagi. It's just a little tiny Omeron relay and I've had no trouble with these units. Okay, so what if, uh, all of the elements are insulated from the boom. In other words, what about those other elements? Well, of course you could add relays, uh, similar to the one at the driver, to those uh, elements as well. Uh, in fact, I have relays at both the driven element uh, and the reflector of my 40 and 80 meter two element interlace Yagi. But for me, it was really easy to do that because I already have uh, boxes at, at both elements, so it was easy to implement. You know, you could, maybe just ground each element, each parasitic element, you know, be it a, a, a number of driven elements or reflectors, you know, since, you know, uh, those element mounts, even if they're insulated, they're at a high, uh, rather a, uh, you know, a, a low voltage, high current node. So really, even if they're grounded at that point, they shouldn't upset the pattern. 
uh, you know, or maybe you don't need to ground them at all. I mean, you know, the boom is still adding, uh, you know, a lot of top loading, uh, you know, and if, you sure, if you've if you bypassed the common mode choke, the driven element is now going to be adding to top loading. So, you know, perhaps it doesn't matter. Uh, and also, what about those multiple Yagi stacks? You know, well, consider that most of the top loading will be from the longer elements. So there's less likely, I think, to be uh, much current flowing into the smaller uh, Yagi elements. And I, you know, in other words, I really think you should focus on the big, long elements. Hey, I hope this has helped answer some of those questions I've had about how I bypass that common mode choke. Hey, look, you know, there's likely to be many other approaches to accomplish this same thing. Uh, but, you know, the fact is, uh, in a lot of situations, it's possible that this is a solution uh, looking for a problem. What I mean is every shunt-fed tower setup is going to be different with different geometries of Yagi top loading. And it's possible that common mode heating, uh, common mode choke heating, you know, it might not even be a problem. Anyway, uh, at the very least, it's good to maybe look at your setup uh, and contemplate how much of that aluminum up there is, <laughs> is actually connected to the tower and contributing uh, to top loading. Uh, 73, this is Steve, V6WZ.